So we are so happy to have you um, here for today's lecture, um, which, which is in conjunction with the exhibition We Lead Others Follow, um, which is curated by the digital archivist Jill um, Hartke, and it's currently on view at Albuquerque Museum. So Hartke, who is giving us the presentation today, is the digital archivist at the museum. Uh, she studied history at the University of Missouri and completed a master's of library science at the University of Missouri. She has worked as a librarian in academic, public, and nonprofit institutions for 10 years and has worked at the museum since 2008 managing the photo archives department. So we're really happy to offer uh, this lecture, lecture and I understand it's National Photography Month, so even better. So um, as resources come up, um, I'll throw things in the chat that you might want to take a look at as Jill mentions them, um, but sit back and enjoy uh, today's lecture and I'll go ahead and turn it back over to Jill. Okay, thanks Elizabeth. Um, I, so I've been here since 2018 um, rather than 2008, but um, this show, um, as, as, Elizabeth, as Elizabeth mentioned, <clears throat> it's on view now and it'll be up through um, November 14th. And the show itself really touches on um, quite a few of the women that I'm going to talk to you about today, um, but it doesn't get into this mentorship network. It touches on the mentorship network, but what I'm going to talk to you about today is really a deeper dive into how these women supported each other and what the early um, field of photography looked like here in, in really early Albuquerque. So, let's see. So there's two different types of mentorship networks that I'm going to talk to you about today. And we're going to begin with the informal mentorship network. And that, that's going to feature Mrs. Albright, Eddie Ross Cobb, and Daphne Cobb. And then we're going to move into the formal mentorship network, which is our organization, which is really um, about the, the Business and Professional Women's Club of Albuquerque and the women um, who, who made up that organization. And so Daphne Cobb is in, is in that one, Alabama Milner and Otelia Hanna. So um, to begin though, I just wanna, so we're all on the same page, photography begins in 1839. And within about a decade, women are already active in the field and it's a brand new field. And so the entrance fee really is just can you get your hands on the equipment necessary to do this work? And if the answer is yes, you can. Re you really could join um, join this new field. And so it's 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 different from other fields at the time that women may have wanted to join, but but were um, excluded from because of guilds or maybe there was there were uh, training uh, schools that you had to, you could only be a man to get into or whatever. But for photography, there's no guilds. There's no formal classes. There's no schools of photography that are set up at this time. So there's actually, there's not, not that systemic discrimination um, by sex that, that you find in other fields. So women, they were kind of um, attracted to, to photography because of its openness and its newness. So if women had the means, they could enter into this new world of artistry and, and technical gadgetry. And so by the 1850s, Ten types um, are really popular, and it's inexpensive. It's quick to produce, and so that makes it easier both for the customer and the photographer to be um, to make a living at it because you can you can really kind of um, turn these out pretty quickly. And also, um, you would find people who would do like traveling um, traveling tin typists. It was something that you could actually you could do like in a tent, or maybe you had. Um, something that was more mobile, so you could do that. You didn't have to invest in a um, in a in a in a house or a or a, a business actually on a particular street. So, um, really, through trial and error, and often apprenticing with a more experienced photographer, usually a relative, um, both um, men and women learn to master the camera. And they started setting up studios all around the country in big cities and in small towns. And so Western settlements often had a, a photographic district, just as you would find in the Eastern cities. And uh, in early Newtown Albuquerque, when we start talking about um, the, the very earliest years, 
um, Gold Avenue really becomes that, that um, space, especially for the women who are, who are opening their own studios. And uh, even though there were, there were women in photography, it was still, they were still considered a bit of a novelty. And sometimes they could use that to their benefit and they could play into that. Um, you would see people, um, women who would put in advertisements in the newspaper saying, you know, if you come and let me take your picture, you're supporting a widow and orphan children. You know, like they would kind of use that a little bit to, um, to make people maybe feel a little bit like you're doing a, a, a larger service than just having your photograph taken if you, if you come in and come to my studio. And um, it could drum up business, you know, and, and sometimes a customer might go to a, a portrait studio um, where a woman owned it and it was sort of a joke. Um, and maybe they were, it was something that they thought was just like I said, like a novelty or something that they would use later, like at a dinner party to, to like amuse other people. But the hope was that um, the photograph and, and the photographer would be so good that that customer who came in as a joke would leave with the impression that actually this is a really great business. And they would tell other, other people like you should go there and have your photograph taken. And so women relied a lot on um, sort of word of mouth and building their reputation and, and essentially really they, they would do what the, what the customer wanted. There was not a lot of, um, pushing back and saying, I only do this type of photography or I only do, um, you know, I can't do what you're asking me to do. Women actually would do quite a lot uh, of different types of photography um, in order to drum up that business. Um, still though, they did face an uphill battle in sort of winning that, like, I guess, legitimacy um, in the field, but it didn't really deter them from entering that, that world. Um, still, there were many who found it prudent to sort of augment their photography business with other side businesses that were already seen as more female dominated um, vocations like millinery or designing and creating wigs. Um, there was a, a thing in the 19th century called hair jewelry where you would take the hair of, of a loved one who had passed away and you could take it to often a woman and, and um, they would kind of turn it in, like braid it or put put um, jewelry into it, it would turn into like a memento that that the family would keep of their loved one. Um, also like teaching art lessons, like things that were already seen as as a woman's realm. And so they would use that. And then maybe if you went in there and you bought a hat or you found a hat that you liked, maybe the, the woman would say, oh, well, I have a, you know, it looks really great on you. I have this studio over here. Why don't we take your picture that way? You know, even when, you know, you, you can just see yourself in this lovely hat, things like that. And so the informal mentorship networks are, that we're going to talk about in, in Albuquerque in 1882, there's one woman who really stands above the rest in terms of a pioneer of photography and a pillar of mentorship. And her name is Mrs. Frank Emma Luce Albright. And her, um, her studio is called Mrs. Albright's Art Parlor. And it really was the launching site of many photographers' careers. And her expertise in, in the field, both in terms of, of artistry and the business side, are unparalleled. There's nobody else in, in early Albuquerque that can do what she is doing. But this informal mentorship chain that she's going to begin and that she's going to lead um, really begins decades before she arrives because Mrs. Albright herself learned her skills at the side of her own mentors. And so um, we're gonna talk about her. She, Sarah Luce Larimer is um, Mrs. Albright, her older sister. So Frances Emma Luce is, is um, the, the name that Mrs. Albright is born with. <laughs> um, and she, she ends up calling herself a myriad of different names. Um, but Mrs. Albright is what she's known as when she is in Albuquerque. Um, and also what she uses as she becomes more prominent in the uh, management of world's fairs and territorial fairs much later in her career. But um, in order to really explain to you the, this, this network that she comes from, um, I'm going to take you back a little bit and, and show you um, where the, the earliest part of, of Frances Emma Luce's life. So she's born in Pennsylvania in 1852. 
Um, and she's one of at least 10 children who survived long enough to appear in census records. Her mother was married twice and widowed twice. So before, um, before Frances is, is even 18 years old, her mother has, is a widow for the second time. And they, her mother gradually moves the family west. So they start in Pennsylvania, and then they move shortly after Frances is born to Iowa, and then to Kansas. And then in the late 1860s, they wind up in the brand new town of Laramie, Wyoming. And so her mother at this point is called Sarah Mills. And Mrs. Mills is running a boarding house um, in Laramie. And you can see from this census record, the boarders who are living in the house are, are usually laborers. There's a blacksmith, there's um, a 12 year old, a 12 year old boy. And there here's Francis. Here's Nettie, this is her younger sister, and then the, the youngest of the group, Cora. Um, and there, but what is interesting is there's a painter, there are three painters living um, with, at the boarding house. And I think that having painters here is, is interesting because it's likely that Francis, who is already interested in art, um, was possibly um, learning from these painters. Whether, and it may have been that the painters were painting houses or something, but they, they also may have been um, artists. They may have been people who, who were painting landscapes or, or um, could help Frances fine tune her, her own artistry or learn different techniques. And, and the, the artistic nature of Mrs. Albright is really, it becomes a, a very important aspect to her business. And really she winds up closing her photography studio before 1910 and lives solely as an artist by the end of her life. And she dies in 1912. But also, if you think about where, think about where she is right now, this is an 18 year old woman in Laramie, Wyoming. And so it's not just these artists that Mrs. Albright is being influenced by because in 1869, Wyoming passed the suffrage act. And so Frances watches her mother and also her older sister, who's not living with them in this boarding house, but whose name is Sarah, um, they gain the right to vote. And so at 18 years old, Frances is seeing women taking part in the running of the Wyoming territory. So in 1870 is the, the first time a woman was elected to serve as justice of the peace. Um, and it was you know, in Wyoming. Laramie is the first spot where women were called to serve jury duty. And in September of 1870 is, is the, first, the first election where women are really, um, really taking part. And so in Laramie, there are 121 eligible women voters for that general election in September of 1870. 93 of them vote. And that's a turnout rate of 75%. So the women are, are active, they want to vote. These are, these are leaders in the community or they're, they're not afraid to to take this new right that they've just gotten and use it. And in fact, the first woman to uh, vote in a, in a general election in the United States is Louisa Swain from Laramie. And so the story goes that the women of Laramie gathered together and chose Louisa, who is a 70 year old woman, to be the first woman, to, to be that, that history maker and, and cast the first vote for women um, after women got the right to vote in Wyoming. So these are the women that Frances is seeing all around her. And her mother is, uh, I, don't, I don't know, the only person, um, the only record of, of the actual names of women who voted is Louisa because she was um, the, the history maker. But, um, so I don't know if Sarah Mills cast a ballot on, on September, uh, in September of 1870, but I would think that she did considering that she's running kind of a business here in town. Um, but regardless of like what up, whether she did or not, Frances is still seeing this happen all around her. And as she's embarking upon her own life as an adult, she's watching women step into these roles that are were not really considered open to them in earlier generations. And I think that this really shapes the kind of adult that Frances will become. And also helping to shape her is her older sister. So this is, this is uh, Mrs. Larimer is um, the older sister of Francis. And they are 16 years apart, so they really didn't grow up together. But um, her older sister, Sarah, is a photographer. And she's very successful. She's a successful businesswoman who, with her husband, ran photography studios in Iowa, Kansas, Colorado, Wyoming, and Texas. 
So Sarah Larimer is kind of a rolling stone, but she does eventually settle in Texas. And I think it's undoubtedly her who sets Francis upon the path to photography, like showing her what equipment was needed, how to get that delivered out, to, out west, how to advertise, how to print negatives, how to colorize the photographs, and really how to make a name for yourself in a new town. And all of the business skills that Mrs. Albright is going to use later in her and showing the younger generations of women how to survive in, in the photography world, she probably first learned from her older sister, Sarah. Um, so as I said, Sarah was already 16 when Francis was born and she married William Jackson Larimer and they set off together um, opening photography studios in the early 1860s. And they really hauled their photography equipment all over the West um, and reportedly even losing one set of equipment during an attack on a wagon train in Montana territory when Sarah and her son were captured by the Sioux. And they escaped after about a day or so, but her experiences with that event really shaped the rest of her life outside of photography. And she becomes very well known um, in her time because she publishes an account of her escape. And so this, this photo or this, this drawing of her comes from the book that she wrote about that experience. Um, but even though she's a, she's a successful author and kind of a, a public face, you can see here in 1880, she is still considers herself a photographer. That's her mode of, that's, that's her vocation. That's what she chooses to be seen. And um, kind of what's interesting is that as you, as you look for Sarah in census records, she routinely cuts, um, like she, she becomes um, younger every 10 years. <laughs> so at this point she's, says she's 36, which is only like 14 years older than her son at this point, but she actually was born in, in 1836. Um, and so in, in 1880, you see here that she is um, living in Humboldt, Kansas, and she has got Mrs. Larimer's photograph rooms. And about 60 miles away in the town of Longton is the, the newly married Mrs. Albright's art parlor. And so they're, they're 60 miles apart from each other. And, um, and I think it's, it's very likely that Mrs. Larimer helped set her younger sister up with her first studio and kind of set her, set her on her wheels kind of in motion to become the, the um, incredible photographer and mentor that Mrs. Albright will be when she comes out here to Albuquerque. So many women um, of this, this earliest generation, they learn the art of photography from their relatives. And sisters are especially strong connections that you see um, as, you get, as you kind of dive into this history a little bit. And Mrs. Albright, throughout their lives, uh, Mrs. Albright routinely visited her sister, Mrs. Larimer, throughout her time in Albuquerque. And if you remember, there was a younger sister on the 1870 census record um, called Nettie. Um, Nettie ends up marrying Mrs. Albright's husband's brother and so and moving in, into New Mexico. And so um, Nettie, uh, Mrs. Albright and Mrs. Larimer are very close and, and they're sort of this, these pillars of support for each other. And um, the story of Mrs. Larimer's life, if you ever, if you're interested, or you just are fascinated about wanting to read about an incredible woman, I would suggest you really look into her because She's, it, it's just an incredible story, not only for her determination, but because of the wealth that she managed to accumulate as a successful photographer, author, and businesswoman. And so she dies in the age of, of 77 um, in 1913, the, a year after Mrs. Albright dies. And Mrs. Larimer leaves behind an estate that was to be divided among her siblings or the heirs of, their, of her siblings. Remember there's like, there was at least like 10 siblings um, and so Mrs. Albright a, has a daughter named Claude, and Claude inherits Mrs. Albright's um, portion of the Larimer, of Mrs. Larimer's estate, which amounts to $75,000 in 1913, and that's, by today's standard, that's over a million dollars. So this is, this is an incredibly successful woman who is acting as a mentor to Mrs. Albright and setting her up really to succeed. And so when we get to Mrs. Albright, um, she really becomes synonymous with quality photography. The name Mrs. Albright's Art Parlor is really, um, it just means it, it, it carries a lot of weight in Albuquerque and, and, and really beyond. 
And so she and her husband, uh, John G. Albright, as I said, they had a daughter named Claude. Um, it's hard to find a it's hard to find good photographs of Mrs. Albright, but um, this is Mrs. Albright, this is Claude. Um, and they were living in Kansas, as I said, and she was running her photographic gallery. But she, at that point, she was tapping into that kind of common practice for, for lady photographers of that, as I mentioned, that, that women's side business. So Mrs. Albright was making, she was a milliner and she would also create hair extensions for her customers in Kansas. But when her husband becomes interested in the newspaper business, they, they moved to Santa Fe in 1880. And that's where Mrs. Albright's art parlor is born and where it, where it begins its time in New Mexico. And she sets it up strictly as an art and photography studio. She, and she, she never really looks back after that in terms of feeling like she needs that side business to, to drum up to bring customers in. She's focusing entirely as, as just a, a photographer and an artist, and she's gonna just gonna go. She's gonna go from there. And so in 1882, they moved to Albuquerque. And so this is right when Newtown Albuquerque is beginning, and she sets up shop on Gold Avenue, which is gonna set the stage for where other her, where others will follow her and set set up their studios on that same street. And I think you know, Mrs. Albright can take more risks than maybe other photographers could at the time because she had quite a few things going for her. Um, first of all, her, her husband is ensconced in his own career. She does have a support system. She's not a widow. She's not a, sing a, a single woman. Um, that she has a support system already in her marriage. And also her younger sister shortly arrives and marries her brother-in-law. And so there's a safety net or the support group um, uh, family-wise that's growing. And um, also, I think also being married to a newspaper man, she has this connection to advertising. So her clever and wordy advertisements show up really routinely in the newspaper. And that also, you know, doesn't hurt her um, in terms of creating her reputation and, and bringing customers in. And her, the Albrights were really um, upper class society, um, they were in that circle. And so um, they, the customers that are coming into Albright's art parlor are the high flying people of the, of the, the old families, the, the um, ones with money are coming to her. So she's a good connection to have. If you're, if you're a new photographer and you're wanting to um, learn A, how to do really good portraiture, but B, how to, how to attract this particular type of clientele who have the money to spend. And so um, she, she's really quite the networker, not only in New Mexico, but all across the country. And so men and women um, seek out Mrs. Albright to have her teach them photography, but also bookkeeping, marketing. And Mrs. Albright was really good at being a networker for her protégés as well. Um, and what's interesting too is it is so in 1882 she sets up shop in Albuquerque, but in 1883 she reopens her art parlor in Santa Fe for a very short run, only about three months, and she joins in partnership up there with a woman named Mrs. Woodruff, and the two of them take part in one of the first sort of territorial fairs that happen, and in Santa Fe it's called the Tertio Millennial Celebration and Exposition. And I think this is the first time that I can find anyway that um, Mrs. Albright gets involved in these types of expositions, but this is a networking hallmark of her career. And she kind of graduates from this to managing exhibitions and pavilions for more territorial fairs and ultimately world's fairs in Chicago, Paris, and St. Louis. Um, and I should, I should mention here, because um, I'm, I'm sort of talking about her like she's the first female photographer, and she's not. She's not the first female photographer in New Mexico. That honor goes to Mrs. Matilda Cox Stevenson, who was photography, uh, photographing the uh, Zuni Pueblo in the 1870s with her husband. But Mrs. Albright is the first known woman to have set up a permanent photography studio in New Mexico. And she's also the first um, to have like a chain, to have like more than one location open. And during that time in 1883, when she had her Albuquerque art parlor and her Santa Fe art parlor. Now there are, from what I can tell, there are at least, and I think there's probably many more that just aren't known, but there are at least nine 
other documented um, women working in photography in New Mexico during those last two decades of the 19th century. Now they're still vastly outnumbered by the known number of male photographers, which is like over 100. Um, but these women were active in the field and successful in, in the profession. And they are making a name for themselves um, in, in, in the territory in New Mexico. And I'm not gonna speak about it here just because of time um, reasons, but um, the, her, Mrs. Albright and her role in the World's Fairs is incredible. And I think she really, that to me, that is really where she was able to, um, to springboard her career um, and, and her, her, her protege's careers um, because she, she had these, these much larger um, platforms from, from which she could design the exhibits and, and decide whose work was going to be shown in these huge expositions. Um, but to talk a little bit about her artistry, um, she would hand tint her photographs to sort of bring out these details. And this was a pretty common practice in the 19th century. Um, when you do look at Mrs. Larimer's work, you'll see that the tinting especially, this, this is a hallmark of Mrs. Larimer's work. And so I think this is another um, example of probably the mentorship and the, the training that Mrs. Albright got from her older sister. But Mrs. Albright on her own, had this incredible skill to be able to skip the camera altogether. And she could create portraits in that more traditional way, but frame them as if they're modern photographs. So this is really, this is a large um, portrait. This is 23 by 18 um, inches, and it's actually a drawing. And so Mrs. Albright's skills are so refined that she could really do nearly anything that a customer might ask for in terms of artistry, in terms of um, her business enterprises, really. So she was an incredibly uh, gifted photographer and artist and definitely highly sought. And so one of her, um, one of her protégés is Eddie Ross Cobb. And so in the late 1880s, Mrs. Albright hires Eddie Ross, who's the daughter of the uh, territorial governor and also um, someone who was already known to the Albrights because the Rosses and the, and the Albrights came from Kansas both of them and um, reconnected here in Albuquerque. And so Eddie actually becomes a clerk and assistant to Mrs. Albright and uh, becomes a very talented photographer in her own right. And she um, learns from Mrs. Albright and then quickly really sets out on her own. And she opens Ross Studio in 1890. And it turns out to be kind of a short-lived enterprise because Mrs. Albright was not really just a professional mentor, but she was kind of a bit of a matchmaker. And so there was a surveyor turned photographer from New York who arrived in Albuquerque. And Mrs. Albright is generally considered to be the one who introduced that young surveyor named William Cobb to her protege, Eddie Ross. And Eddie and William become partners in Cobb's studio and they, they receive high praise from the Santa Fe New Mexican newspaper for their work and for their newly renovated studio at 115 Gold Avenue. So they set up shop right down the street from, from Mrs. Albright. And they're working together actually before they get married, but they do get married and they jointly run Cobb Studio for the rest of their marriage. And they have four children and Cobb Studio really is a family affair. And William dies in 1909, and, and it leaves Eddie to run the studio on her own for like the next 30 years. And so she relies, I think, really heavily on, on the, the skills that she picked up from, from Mrs. Albright, really, and, and especially advertising. Um, in the earliest years of the studio, Eddie sewed like portraits onto her skirt, on, on, on her dress. And they had a large banner that said like the Cobbs and Cobbs Studio. And she could like, she would have her picture taken with it as, as part of advertising. But I can kind of imagine that she probably stood outside, you know, on Gold Avenue wearing this as, as a way to drum up business and get people in the door. And she would also take out advertisements. And her advertisements are similar to the way that Mrs. Albright would advertise, which is sort of, giving messages directly to the reader and speaking as if it's a conversation already. It's not just a slogan, it's, it's, a, it's talking to a friend. And that's the way that um, Mrs. Albright and, and Eddie Cobb, how they both advertise. Um, now two of the Cobb children, Daphne, this is Daphne here, 
and Wilfred, this is Wilfred, they both show interest in photography. And so Eddie mentors them both. And Wilfred winds up in the Navy as a photographer and Daphne ultimately joins her mother in the running of Cobb Studio. And Mrs. Albright uh, did, she would take her camera out of her studio and photograph the community a little bit, but she really, her, her um, talent and her artistry really was set up for portraiture. And Cobb Studio, also did a lot of portraiture, but they also would go out much more. Eddie and William Cobb both were focused on the community and they, they wanted to document it when they could. And so they were really one of the first studios who you really see splitting their time and their talents between that in-house portrait studio and outreach or commercial clients. And Mrs. Albright's art parlors, they did, she did community photography. In fact, she she would take the photos for the for UNM's yearbooks. Um, but I think Eddie Cobb and, and Cobb Studio kind of pushed the role of women in photography into, into like a broader um, space in terms of getting out and documenting what was outside the studio. And um, also, oh, so, excuse me, but also what's interesting about Cobb Studio is that they would have these, these um, beautiful backdrops and they could do group portraits. But later, this is later, Eddie's running the studio by herself at the time that, that, that this particular portrait is taken. And you kind of notice that they, she's creating actual set, like set design in the, in the portrait studio. And she's, it's not just like a prop, it's not just a chair or a flower. I mean, there, she's really creating um, almost a, a story with her portraiture. And so Daphne um, learns, as I said, Daphne learns from her mother. Um, she's a, like essentially in, in Albuquerque, she is the third generation, um, the third link in this mentorship chain, this informal one. And um, her mother, uh, Eddie, her experience in society circles, both because she did actually work with her father in the political realm before she became um, a photographer. And then also alongside her husband in the running of the studio, she had this unique perspective in terms of how to use systems, um, business systems and political systems to, to sort of to your personal benefit, to the benefit of, of, your, of your enterprise. And she passes that knowledge down to her children. And Daphne especially takes an eager interest in civic engagement. And she's known from an early age as, as a young woman with a very strong mind of her own. She has quite a few opinions of her own. And so at 14, she's um, already active in, in Albuquerque organizations. And she's elected president of the newly created Loyal Temperance Legion in Albuquerque, which is like the children's branch of the Women's Christian Temperance Union. So Daphne's already sort of out and about and, and joining organizations, formal organizations, as a young teenager. And in 1920, Daphne is identifying herself as a, the master photo finisher and representing Cobb Studio at like town hall meetings with alongside her mother. Um, she's, she, is, she is for all intents and purposes helping to manage Cobb Studio. And um, she also, again, she sort of is following the, the model of her mother um, in terms of not restricting her work to just the studio. So she she is particularly interested in the Pueblos. And so she travels all around New Mexico with her camera documenting um, the Pueblos. And Daphne really is our first introduction to this generation of women who transition from that traditional informal mentorship network of women relatives typically mentoring their own, their own children, their own younger siblings, um, and then supporting them as they enter into the into the, the career of photography. And Daphne comes from that um, network, but she goes into this more formalized civic organization structure and that, that's built on a foundation of public membership and a commitment to furthering women in business in, in more formal ways. So she's our bridge to talk about the formal mentorship network here, and specifically the Albuquerque Business and Professional Women's Club. And um, 
So Daphne, as I said, Daphne's the bridge, and then there's Alabama Milner and Otelia Hanna. And I do believe that there could be an argument made that Mrs. Albright was participating in a formalized mentorship um, network because of her managing of world's fairs and territorial fairs. And I think that she was absolutely involved um, in as formal a mentorship system as she had access to. But I feel like in Albuquerque, this, 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 the creation of this club is really um, the beginning of a formal and public mentorship program for women. And it's set up to support women in business um, through mentorship and a loyalty to what they call the nobler sisterhood. And I think it's interesting. This is published in the newspaper. Their object, the club, they had a club obligation. There was an emblem benediction. Like there were these very formal things that, that these women were dedicating themselves to when they joined this club. And I think it's interesting that they went to the trouble to write out these foundational documents, spell out exactly what they're organizing around, and then publish it. And I think it maybe it could point to the idea that maybe that older informal mentorship system that worked really well for some, but it probably it, it had room for improvement. And the Albuquerque Club, well, all of these clubs really, Albuquerque was the second one in New Mexico. The very first one of these clubs was in Raton. Um, but they, the clubs are, are affiliated with the National Federation of Business and Professional Women's Clubs. And that began in 1919. And it's no coincidence that the club began right around the ratification of the 19th Amendment. And women are, some women are beginning to feel that that door to leadership and, and policy making on a larger level is, is like it's cracking open, right? And some women have felt this for generations. Like I, I, I truly believe that Mrs. Albright knew that women could have an active role because of what she'd seen when she was 18 in Wyoming. But for a lot of women, it's this moment here in 1919, 1920, when they're actually feeling like, okay, I'm actually, I can have a voice in, in, in my community and in, in the state and in the government. And so um, the creation of this organization meant that a woman no longer had to rely on a relative or tracking down a photographer and begging him or her to let them be an apprentice for a while. This system, meant that a woman could independently decide, like, I want to join the business world. And I don't really know anybody who can teach me, but here's an organization that I can join where there's already women involved in it. And by virtue of their membership and their expertise, they're dedicated to boosting the opportunities for younger women in business. This is a really big shift. Um, and it really does serve to like kick open the door that was slightly open for some people if they were um, connected to the right people. This formalizing these kinds of mentorship programs just it made it more equal for for more women to be involved. And in Albuquerque, the club attracted a, a true variety of women, and they were they were committed to working toward overcoming inequality, discrimination, and justice for women in business. Um, as you see here, you can read their obligation, their benediction, the object, and they. Um, you know, it, it was built in that they were supposed to keep their ears attuned to the plea of the younger woman. So mentorship is absolutely at the heart of this. And early on, there's two of Albuquerque's leading photography studios who are represented in, in the very first, the very early years of this club. So as I said, Daphne Cobb and Cobb Studio, she's in it. And then Milner Studio, um, represented by the owner and operator, Alabama Milner. And they were joined by women who were like employed by the US Forest Service, the city librarian, the principal of the US Indian School, the city clerk. Um, Dr. Evelyn Frisbee is one of the first presidents of the club. And she's the first woman to, who opened a medical practice in Albuquerque. There's real estate agents. There's um, business owners like Mrs. Maisel, um, stenographers, nurses. All of these women are part of this club. and. Sadly, uh, Daphne Cobb dies in 1928, and I really haven't been able to find out if her mother um, joined in her stead, if, if Cobb Studio remained um, active in this more formalized organization, or if, if Cobb Studio was no longer um, committed to this club um, after Daphne's death. 
Um, Eddie, Eddie Cobb does continue to own and operate Cobb Studio until the 1940s, though. Um, she dies in 1942, and even though her son Wilfred was a photographer and, and Eddie had mentored him and, and he you know, was a photographer in the Navy, um, Eddie chooses not to sign the business over to him. She just closes up shop. But back to the club here for a minute. So aside from their loyalty and sort of their determination to raise the standard for women in business in Albuquerque, they also, these women also kind of wanted to influence the whole state. And so um, in 1925, there's the, um, the contest, I guess, to, to design a new state flag. And so Albuquerque's Business and Professional Women's Club creates a flag and they submit it to the contest and it becomes actually one of the three finalists. And so they launch a campaign in the newspaper to try to push for the selection of their club design as the new flag. But it ultimately loses to, to our current state flag design, which was designed by um, a physician and his wife in, out of Santa Fe. But still, that, that, that anecdote is really just to show you that these are not shrinking violets by any, by any means. They were finding purpose in this network. They were believing that they were stronger together. They routinely brought speakers in to give lectures. They met, they met, they met um, like every month. And because these are women who were very likely to cast ballots after they had gotten the right to vote, the, the politicians in town were like flocking to their meetings to try to um, explain what their platforms were and try to get these women to, to support their particular party. But they would also bring in like leading feminists, um, civic leaders, they would send delegations to national conferences. So they were, they were broadening their network because they were part of the larger federation of these clubs. They could meet women who were in similar fields to them all across the country. And so this is a very strong and powerful um, club that they've, that they've created and that they're um, helping to, to lead. And, and then it also, what it's also doing is that this formal organization of mentorship is making the networks that had sort of been in place informally for generations more visible. And so the announcements in the paper that you start seeing, um, the, the, the elections of their officers, you're just beginning to really the public is starting to see that women actually had all of these networks going on behind the scenes that maybe people weren't aware of. And so this is bringing to light how connected women actually were and how supportive they have been um, for, for decades and for generations, not just in photography, but in photography in particular here. And so I want to talk a little bit about Alabama Milner really quick because she takes the role of mentor and her, her loyalty to this to the foundation of this club to heart. She kind of runs with it. Um, she owns and operates Milner Studio by herself from the 1920s through the, through the 1950s, about till 1957. And she dedicates herself to hiring women as her assistants. So here are two of her assistants in, in the studio. This is Milner Studio. And when you look at the city directories and you see who's working for Alabama Milner, she often also would hire widows. Um, and there are, I think what's interesting when I'm, when I'm like doing research into these women, there, there are some parallels between Alabama Milner and Mrs. Albright. And in some ways it's just that they came from these very large families and they relied on the support of their siblings and were themselves pillars of support in return. But I think what's very interesting and what kind of puts a distinction between the generation that Mrs. Albright was from and the generation here that Mrs. or that Alabama Milner is a part of is that where Mrs. Albright had a sister who could teach her photography and bring her into the field, none of Alabama Milner's um, siblings when she wanted to become a photographer were already photographers themselves. So Milner had to find another way into the field. And so she actually put herself through the first um, photography school, the first school that was dedicated to the art of photography. And it, it happened to be in McMinnville, Tennessee. It was called the Southern School of Photography. So she actually began in a formal, she, she went to, through a formal education um, into the field. And she learned alongside men and women, and she was taught by men and women. And she took those skills and joined the, the professional world of photography right around like 1901, 1902. 
And she didn't come to Albuquerque until about 1917 or 1918, but she quickly makes her mark here. And her work really speaks to the quality of education that she received and also the quality of training that she could impart to these younger women who were trying to join the field. And she does portraiture, but not in the way that Mrs. Albright or the Cobbs did portraiture. She has this affinity for sort of flow and movement. And Mrs. Albright continues that kind of evolution of, of the women broadening their scope. And she, she takes her camera out into these industrial areas and spends a lot of her time um, photographing sort of the working areas of Albuquerque, the working class. And there's a style that starts to come through on her work. And you, you can start to recognize her work because it does, it does look different. It does look like she did have formal training. It does look like um, sort of, it, it's a new generation of photography and a new quality that you don't always see um, in men or women of, of previous generations. Um, and then the last woman that I wanna talk about is Otelia Hanna. And she, um, was co-owner of Hannah and Hannah with her husband, Milton. And they, they arrive in, 19, in Albuquerque in 1914 and they set up shop. And uh, Otelia joins the Business and Professional Women's Club, but I think it's after Daphne Cobb has already passed away. So, she's, so Hannah and Milner are in the club together. And Otelia Hannah is an incredibly savvy woman. She was born in Russia and she immigrated to the United States in the early 20th century. She met Milton in Illinois and then they moved out to Albuquerque and they opened, opened their studio. And Otelia really seems to have like taken the helm in terms of the business portion of the studio because she was advertising, she was buying out male competitors. She was conversant in at least five languages which made her um, able to communicate with practically anybody who, whose path she would come across. Um, she was really engaged in things like the war bond drives um, in trying to get women to use their, their right, their, their right to vote. She's just a, a really intrepid woman, again, in the photography world here in Albuquerque. And uh, Milton and Otelia had a son and he was, uh, his name was Milton Jr., but they called him Bud. And he took over the studio and he ran it until 1984. And that makes Hannah and Hannah the longest running photography studio in Albuquerque's history. And Otelia Hannah is the only example of these early women photographers who was able to pass on their business to their, to their child um, to, as an inheritance. And the studio did portraiture again, but it actually really was more focused on commercial avenues. And so the thing that you see, as I've mentioned before, as you go through these, these women and these generations um, of photography in Albuquerque, you start to see that broadening of the scope of their work. Um, Hannah and Hannah becomes one of Clyde Tingley's favorite studios to call on. And so, so the Hannahs find themselves um, out in the city documenting all of the photo ops for Clyde Tingley and all of these um, celebrities that are coming and also work for like magazines. Um, they, they're very active. If you start looking at um, the collection from the Albuquerque Progress, which was like a monthly magazine that documented the development of the city from the 1930s to the 60s, Hannah and Hannah is all over that. They were, they were always um, hired to, to do that kind of work. And uh, their photographs, so as I said, their photographs show up in all sorts of collections. They had all sorts of clients. But something that kind of sticks out to me when I was looking um, at all of their work is that they do have this tendency to document women's work. And a lot of our museum's documentation of Albuquerque women at work come from Hannah and Hannah. And Otelia Hannah was elected president of the Business and Professional Women's Club in 1948. And I think in some respects, it is a nod to the fact that women in, in photography here in town had been at the forefront of business mentorship here for generations. And so I kind of see the election of Hannah as not just a vote for the leadership of her in particular, but an acknowledgement of the leadership of the female photographers in town and their dedication to the mentorship of women and maybe, you know, in this, in this particular club, outside the field of photography, just in business in general. And the success of these women and the success of the businesses that they were operating 
um, that the, the, of the specifically of the women that I've talked about today, I think is maybe made most obvious by the fact that Mrs. Albright's art parlor was the shortest run of these photography studios and she ran hers for 25 years. So these women are, they're dedicated to photography, they're incredible business women, and they really made their mark um, on, on the business world of, of these, of Albuquerque in, the, in these early decades of, of, its, of its life. And so um, the women that I've mentioned today, these are not, as I said, these are not the only female photographers in Albuquerque. They're not even the only ones who, um, who I know have benefited from these mentorship lines. Um, but a lot of the names that you do find in like the city directories from the late 19th and early 20th century, the female photographers are just names. Um, their work has not survived. And I think um, as, Elizabeth, as Elizabeth mentioned at the beginning, this, this whole talk is really um, in conjunction with the show that's up in the museum right now, the photo show called We Lead, Others Follow. And that's taken from um, the advertisement for that Mrs. Albright put in the paper. And I think um, it's, it's, in, it's in some ways because women have gotten erased from history, their work, it does have a tendency to get lost or to be seen as less important than their male counterparts. And they, it was, happening at the time that they were working as well. And they combated it in their own day and in their own ways. Um, but I think now for us, uh, for historians and for people interested in, in the role of women, I think it's important to think a little harder about that traditional narrative that we're often taught about um, women not choosing to join a workforce um, or, or that, that they wouldn't have been working if they could have done anything else. I think in, in many cases, these women chose it and they were trying to steer their own ship. And so um, I think the whole, so as I said, the, the show, um, it's up until November 14th and it's, it's really um, focusing on five photography studios in early Albuquerque that are run by women either in their entirety or in equal partnership. And the caveat really is that the women had to start their, um, begin their business before the passage of the 19th Amendment. I used that kind of as the end date for when I wanted, I wanted these women already in business. Um, so it's up through November. I hope you can come and see it. You'll see some of the photos that have been in this show, you'll, or in this presentation, you'll see on the walls. And there's a, a kind of a biography, a short one of uh, the five women that I'm highlighting. And um, I did want to just add like a couple of other resources. If you're at all interested in this topic, um, there's a couple of other things that are happening that, that might be of interest. And one is there's a, a fairly new book that's out and it's um, focusing a lot on like the Mrs. Albright and her older sister, like their contemporaries. It's called Women in the Dark and it's female photographers in the US 1850 to 1900. Um, it was just published last fall. It does not dive into any of the women that I've talked about here, except Mrs. Larimer is mentioned really briefly, and you do get to see one example of her work in the book. Um, and it goes, what I do really like about it is it's an easy read. It's, it's really, it's well done, but it goes into some really great information about the 1893 Chicago World's Fair. And Mrs. Albright was really instrumental in managing that fair. And it talks a little bit about the influence of that, of that fair on women photographers and also how um, some male journalists uh, viewed it as threatening um, to male photographers, I guess. So it's, it's interesting. And the book kind of goes into that a little bit more if you're interested. And then um, just kind of as like, like an FYI, I guess, if you're like beginning, if you're, if you're like looking forward ahead and you're like, there's like a post COVID world that we might be going into here and you decide that you're getting antsy and you want to travel and you're, you're thinking about New York City or Washington DC later this year, um, the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York City and the National Gallery of Art in Washington DC are going to both be holding um, an, an exhibit called the new woman behind the camera. And it actually picks up where we lead others follow um, leaves off. 
And so um, in terms of the generation of women photographers, so their show is gonna be looking an international view of the women who took up photography in the 1920s through the 1950s. And so I think it's supposed to open in New York City in July, and then it'll move to DC in the fall. So if you're really into this topic, um, that I hope you come and see the show here, but also um, that's kind of picks up where we leave off here and, and it does a, an international view. So that's all I really have. I thank you for listening and for, um, for just attending. I hope it was interesting. I hope you got something out of it. Um, I find them really interesting. These women are kind of, um, kind of my role models now. So <laughs> if you have any questions, uh, let me know. And I'm happy to chat a little while here. Thank you so much, Jill. So we actually do have uh, one question that came up in the chat. Um, I think, uh, let's see, it's from Barbara. And Barbara says, uh, were the images you showed made by the women themselves or hired photographers in their studio or a combination of both? Do you know that information? I don't know exactly who the maker of every photo was. Um, I do tend to think like with the cobs, um, my feeling is that if it's after, if we date it typically after 1910, I do think that that's Eddie or Daphne who's made that, um, who's, who's involved in that. And you can actually pick out the earlier years for Cobb Studio. Um, you can pick out Eddie's handwriting compared to William's handwriting. And so you do, you do kind of, um, you see Eddie, you see her mark in, in those photographs. Um, but for Mrs. Albright, it, it would be really difficult to tell because I didn't really talk about this much at all, um, but she, her daughter, Claude, becomes an internationally renowned opera singer. And so Mrs. Albright spends a lot of time away from Albuquerque um, in Paris and in Chicago. Those are the connections. Why she becomes um, involved in the World's Fairs is actually because her daughter is in those, are in those um, locations becoming an opera singer, learning voice lessons and things. So Mrs. Albright is often not in town, especially in the late 1890s and into the early 1900s. So it is her assistants that are often um, making those, those works. But for a lot of them, and I, I typically think that you can read an Alabama Milner photograph and you know it's her. So I do tend to think that Milner did her own work, but then she did, she did have female assistants. So either they were trained incredibly well <laughs> and then you can't really tell a difference or it's Alabama who's really leading that. Anything else? Great. Thanks so much. So I will open it up. If anybody has any comments or questions, you're welcome to unmute um, if you'd like to do that. We'll give you a few minutes to see if you wanna do that. Uh, yes, this is Joe Morris. I, I wonder if you have, uh, if th these women, especially the first uh, um, photographers that opened their studio here, if they competed with each other, because it seems like, if anything, they helped each other and they, they yes, you know, yes. So, I think that, yeah, I think that at least, at least for, Mrs. Albright, she seems, um, she, I think I kind of feel like she was so, um, her, her skill was so high that her competition was really not, nobody was really doing what she was doing. I think that might've been why she kind of comes off as a, a little bit more benevolent and why she does have so many assistants and she sort of launches them out into the world. I think now they may have been more competitive. Her protégés may have, felt that they needed to, to compete with each other. Um, but as far as Mrs. Albright goes, I don't think that she, she didn't really have competition in terms of what she could do. Um, and her, her, uh, her older sister, her older sister, I don't, I don't know. She moves around so much that I don't know. I'm sure there was a, a competitiveness that had to come into that just because she was always new and so many, so many towns she had to make her mark. Um, but I don't, I don't, once it gets into the, um, yeah, the later, the later women who join that club, it's actually written into the club that there's no competition. So, which does lead me to think that there probably was some competition and why they had to spell that out. 
but I don't think that Mrs. Albright um, felt that way. I've never gotten that that sense. So. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Anybody else? Well, thank you so much, Jill, for today's presentation. Wonderful context about, uh, you know, wonderful backstory about these art, these women, um, their impact on the community, and really, I think their role within a larger society of changing roles for women. So there, there was just a lot packed into there, and we appreciate it so much. Um, so thank you all for joining us today, and uh, you all have a good uh, evening and afternoon. Take care. Thank you.